Dave Ramsey here, and this is the last episode of our limited series, Real Estate, The Ramsey Way. Today, we're talking about how to get rid of the ball and chain too many homeowners are dragging around, the mortgage. I know, paying off your mortgage early seems impossible, but it is completely doable, and people do it all the time. But how can you do it? And why would you want to put in the extra effort? Well, stick around to find out why paying off your mortgage early will rev up your wealth building journey. Carl is next in St. Louis. Hey, Carl, what's up? Hey, how are you doing, Dave? So glad to talk to you. Uh, really excited to get in the air with you. Well, thanks. Um, so uh, my wife and I have kind of been in debt most of our life. And um, boy, I wish I found you 20 years ago. And uh, we paid off so much of our debt. Uh, we paid off my car a little quicker. And after that, we started putting that car payment towards her car. Then we got sick and tired of her car and started putting extra from savings to it. And we kept our savings at a set level and put the extra against that car. And I was talking to my financial advisor about a week ago and she's like, Oh my gosh, you just got one more month of this. Just pay it off. You're going to feel so glad you did. And so I did, I paid off the car and boy, did I feel excited. So the only debt we have remaining is our house. And uh, we owe $45,000 on the house. Um, we have 35,000 in savings. Um, and uh, my financial advisor is like, oh, man, you should just, just put 25 of that against your house. You can pay that off in four months then and just be done with it and then build your savings back up. And so I was kind of like, you know, should I leave more in savings? Should I just follow that? Just just take a big 25000 chunk against savings and just knock the house out quick? Or should I just keep paying on the house more and knock it out in about nine months? Good for you. Wow. Well, I like your financial advisor. <laughs> I thought you might. I mentioned yeah. your name to her so much of the time. <laughs> yeah, she she, uh, she hates so. debt. She hates debt bad, and <laughs> and that's good because your income, once you get it all freed up, is she she knows the truth is going to become your most uh, powerful wealth building tool when you're not giving it all to someone else as a way of life, and you're beginning to experience the emotions of these numbers in the last few months. It sounds like, and it's very exciting for you. I'm, I'm, exciting. I'm proud of you. Very, <laughs> yeah, super cool. exciting. Okay, so we teach a process very, that comes from the same principles that she's leaning on. That's why she and I like each other, I can tell. And um, so baby step one is save $1,000. You've done that. Okay, baby step two is become debt-free other than the home. And you've done that. Baby step three is have an, an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. Okay. Okay. So I don't want your savings below three months of household expenses. So if your household expenses are three grand a month, then we can go with her plan. Well, without a house payment, it would definitely be. Oh, below you have that a house payment. Sure. You have a house payment still. <laughs> yeah, once that's knocked out, then, um, with house payment, it's probably okay. With house payment, monthly expenses is probably um, well, probably pretty close to three. Okay. Right. Well, no, that's not true. I don't think it's that much. I'd say it's probably, I mean, the house payment is my What's biggest your household part of it. income? Um, um, I make 145 My wife makes 48 right about 48 okay. She's so, hourly. A couple, couple of hundred a year. Okay. And yep. so, um, uh, um, yeah, and if you take, you said there's 35 in there, right, in your savings? Yes. And yes. 40 on the house, or 40 or 45 on the house? 35 in the house. Okay. So if we throw 25 at it, leave 10 in there, like she suggests, uh, that means we have 20 left on a $200,000 household income, and you're done by Christmas then. Yeah, I'd be done by Christmas for sure. Yeah. Okay. I don't want you below 10. Uh, cause I, I, Are you okay with 10? Um, borderline, but... but um, I just want you to gauge everything around you and be, be very wary because if you have a $15,000 event, we got a problem, dude, and you make two hundred grand, and that's silly. The other idea I had that I kind of threw at my wife is um, we, we were putting what – you know, the first thing was um, take our house payment, put our two car payments against it, and then put the extra we're putting from savings, which takes us to a house payment of 5100 a month. We're just going to keep cranking it up. And so my other idea was – Every month, you know, pay that and then pay an additional five grand from savings and kind of see how we feel as we're going with that. That would be okay, too. Um, yeah, I just don't want, if I could establish real comfortably what three was, I mean, I'd be more comfortable with 15. 
I'd probably do it if it okay. was 15. But okay. pe people often call I'm me and that. say, I have enough money in my savings account to pay off my house today, and it would leave me with $1,000 left in my account. And I would tell them no. And I, I'm the get out of debt guy. And I'm still telling them no, because I don't want you sitting there with $1,000 at this stage of your financial plan. Now, at the beginning of your financial plan, when you're broke and got a bunch of other debts and everything else, you're living on beans and rice. But this is more intentional than it is intensity at your stage. And so I just want to be wise and careful, even though I'm as excited as you are to get you out of debt. So I'm guessing that either way, you're out of debt by Christmas. Yeah, it's going to be really close. If not, I mean, if we live yeah. a little bit more near, it's going to. I think we're. Yeah. I mean, another we're way you could really another way you could work it is, uh, we can against it. you know, another you know, we're just keep manipulating the numbers here. But if you said, okay, let's just call it three to six months, let's call it twenty grand, throw uh, the rest of it at it, and then just ch start chunking on the house. You're still going to make it, and if you don't, reach over and pull ten out and take it down to ten for one month. Yeah in December, but just yeah, go, you I know, you. December, I'm done. As long as I don't go below 10 in my savings, but you could, if the math works, the math works on throwing it at the debt or it works in throwing it in the account and then pulling out of the account. So either way is fine. Um, and, uh, but I, I would not stop. Are you saving for a 401k? I would not stop that. Absolutely. Yeah. My wife puts about 11% in, I'm putting about 7% in, yeah, okay. then I'm putting about another 8% into, uh, uh, Roth IRA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're getting you got the right numbers in. I wouldn't stop that either. So the the, the difference is only whether it's uh Christmas or whether it's March. That's the only difference. And in at and when you're seventy five years old, the, the, that right. date won't matter. I, I like the advice, Dave, and I'd actually be a little bit more cautious with that savings because if if it's me and I really want to get this because it's just intensity, he sees the finish line, how could you make five to ten grand extra? That's what I'm looking at. I, I, I like that savings posture. I really do. Having that just in case a big event happens. Because you're talking about the difference between three months. Mm -hmm. So it's great advice. I certainly agree with you. I wouldn't. Personally, I started getting a little nervous listening to that going lower than 15 myself. I was yeah. like, ooh. Yeah. 10 or 15 has got to be your floor yeah. for sure. But, I mean, you could just throw money, you know, leave the savings sit like it sits and throw money at the house, and then when you get within striking distance of taking it down to 15, then do it in one lick. Yeah. Then you're sitting on savings the whole time while you're waiting to do it, and um, that won't mess you up either. You'll still get there in exactly the same period of time. Exactly. And so, yeah, it's a great place to be, though, Carl. I love where your head's at, and I, I like that you found a financial advisor who's understood that getting out of debt is the key to building wealth. Because not having any payments, you know what you can do if you don't have any payments? Anything you want. I mean, it opens up the door, baby. It's uh, Americans live in such bondage that we don't even know what it's like to be free. Yeah, I was getting ready to say, if you're new to the show and you're listening and watching, Carl is a great example of where you can be. You know, he started off by saying, I wish I had found you 20 years ago, but they've, they've jumped into the process. And now he's looking at the finish line. He can't get there fast enough. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. John is with us. John's in Tampa. Hi, John. How are you? Good, sir. How are you doing today? Better than I deserve. What's up? So I have my wife in the background listening. She works in mortgages, some prior Marine Corps veteran. We recently sold our property that we owned, and we stood to gain $175,000 from the property. We own another house, and our goal is to be debt-free. We follow, we follow your principles. We both go to church. And we owe about a hundred, uh, about one hundred twenty thousand dollars in the property and an eighteen thousand dollar car payment. Uh, today, when I finish work, I'll be going to pay off that car. Uh, our question, uh, collaboratively, is: Do we do a recast and put fifty thousand, sixty thousand down on the house and pay it off in a year, or do we go out and pay it off outright? Our savings: We have about thirty thousand dollars in savings, so. Just sort of wanted to hear your perspective. So, if you pay it off outright, how much is left in savings? There's about thirty-five thousand. So you wouldn't have to touch pay. that. Um, no. Okay. Uh, as a as a whole, there be okay. So why yeah, would you not just pay off your house and your car today? Our biggest worries is that if we're in a if we if we find ourselves um, in, in a recession or a uh, a housing market uh, issue. We wanted to have money 
to potentially go and buy a house on the cheap, potentially a, a re, not a refinance, what do you call them, a, um, a foreclosure. Um, we just want to hear your perspective. So you would not pay off your house in order to maybe buy a foreclosure if the housing market tanks? That, that's our idea. Or our idea is to have, you know, have that amount of money set aside. Okay. I would tell you, regardless of inflation and regardless of recession, that your best goal, your best process is to never buy a rental property except with cash and to never do that until your personal residence is paid for. And so that that set of principles that I've used in my life and for millions of other people would lead me to pay off your house and your car today. So pay off, pay off the house. If it wasn't a rental property, it was a secondary, it was a secondary. I would be debt free before I wrote any checks to buy rental property and I would only pay cash for rental property then. So the point being, we're going to pay off this other property. We're going to pay off your house. You're going to, house, you're going to pay off your car. You're going to be a hundred percent debt free. And if $35,000 left in the bank, you've got all of your income now to start saving to buy a foreclosure when the housing market goes down someday, I don't know when it's going to go down. Uh, not soon enough right. to change this answer. Okay, so give, what you're saying is give you a call back in a month and scream on the air that we're debt free. There you go, brother. Or next week if you want. Yeah. You, or, or tomorrow if you want. But yeah, because <laughs> you're debt free. Pay off everything. That's what I would do. Listen, something's uh, the the, uh, the worry, the angst that you have around the economy. You're watching the news too much, number one. You need to turn the channel off. But number two, uh, the worry and the – it's real, but there's no sense in just bathing in the blood every night, the blood of the newscast. And so, uh, 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 you know, the angst that I hear, what, what, you're, what you don't see coming is that when you pay off all of this stuff, you're going to get peace. Yes. And you don't even realize that that's there. So – because a hundred percent, we've done detailed research. A hundred percent of the foreclosures occur on a home with a mortgage. If you're wondering how paying off your mortgage early would work for your financial situation, let us help you crunch some numbers. Use our free mortgage calculator to find out how increasing your monthly payment can shorten your mortgage term and help you get rid of it as soon as possible. Just go to the link in the show notes or RamseySolutions.com slash payoff calculator to check it out. David is calling from Saigon, Vietnam. I think that's my first call from Saigon in 30 years. David, how are you? <laughs> Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> good. What are you doing in Saigon? Uh, um, uh, living abroad. I've been living, uh, my wife and I have been living abroad for about 16 years, uh, but our investments and properties are in the U.S. Cool. What do you do for a living? And, uh, international educator. Okay. So I teach. The teacher, right. yeah. Oh, I was going to say, that sounded a lot like Art Vandelay's importer-exporter <laughs> from Seinfeld. <laughs> I've got a... Nice. I actually nice. have Seinfeld a good friend a whose brother lives in Saigon that is in your business, and I'm wondering if you're him. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. All right. Go ahead, brother. How can we help? Maybe I know him. Um, well, um, okay, we, uh, we're we big fans of the baby steps. We've, we've done them all. We've done them all except for one, and I might get in trouble from you on this one, and that is that we have two rental properties that um, that are turning um, a profit, and we don't want to pay off the rest of the mortgage because we feel like we're making more having that money invested in the market. So, and I know you, uh, with your baby steps, you um, highly I recommend paying off those mortgages. Or we're thinking, why do that if we can make more if that money is in the market? Can you share your wisdom? Oh, you want, you want to know why I say you do that? Oh, I see. Okay. And how much money do Share you? How much them. money do you have in investments? Uh, a little over a million. Good for you. Well done. How old are you? Uh, Fifty-seven. Excellent. And how much are these mortgages? Uh, they're about one hundred and seventy each. So three forty knocks it out, and that leaves you with six sixty in your investment. If we use that investment to pool to do that, okay? Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. And, and so really what we're discussing is how much more you would make on 340000 over the interest on the houses, okay? Now, yes. here's the thing. Um, I first approached this through the lens of faith is, was my first approach because I have all the letters and licenses after my name, the academic crap that says I'm supposed to know something about money, but I went broke. So apparently I did something wrong. 
Um, and I, I, and so I discovered uh, common sense and what the Bible says about money, and I can't find anywhere as a Christian, this is my, my journey, not yours, okay? I can't find anywhere in the Bible ever that says anything positive about debt. It's not a salvation issue. You're not going to hell because you have debt. It's not a God loves you less if you have debt. It's all negative, though. Uh, the borrower is slave to the lender. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. All the negative references from that. So as, as part of my faith walk, I had to say, okay, God must know something or that I don't understand about debt because I was taught if you can borrow money at, um, you know, three, four, five percent on your mortgage and you can invest it in a mutual fund and make 10 or 12, then you're making that spread, that arbitrage, which is what you're discussing, Correct. Yes, exactly. Now, now, as I've gone forward, what I've discovered is that the vast majority of wealthy people that we've studied, uh, people of faith or otherwise, have avoided debt and gotten out of debt and, uh, and have stayed away from it. And I kind of had to stop and go, why is that? And I find very few people, now you're not highly leveraged, but I, I find very few people that are highly leveraged that actually survive. The people that borrow money like crazy to buy rental properties and do an Airbnb and all this crap, uh, they're all broke in mm. 10 years. I went broke doing that mm. within within 10 years. And so you can't find someone that's been doing that for 20 years and survived. One of these economic cycles takes their head off. And so what that means is that debt equals risk. More debt equals more risk. And I think we can all agree to that. Can you? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. you have little. You have a small amount of debt, so it doesn't feel like a lot of risk. It's not as much risk as if you had three point four million. Agreed. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. More debt is more risk. Yeah. Less debt is less debt is less risk. Zero debt is approaching zero risk. And the only thing, mm -hmm. the only math formula I have found that adjusts for risk does not exist in the real estate world. It's only in the investment world. And we adjust for risk using the math formula of a beta. A beta is the height of a, uh, if you do peaks and valleys of an investment, it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. The, the, difference, in the, val the difference in the peak and the valley is called a beta. You're, and it's your, the vol higher beta is a higher volatility, a, a steeper mountain and a more often cycle. Does that make sense? Yes. And in the investment world, we use a beta. The higher the beta, the higher the risk because the more volatile it is. And we use an inverse relationship in the math, meaning you drop it under the denominator and get nerdy here. But the, that gives you the ability to calculate risk into the investment and measure a risky investment against a not-so-risky investment that has a lower beta. And you've, you've neutralized for risk. Therefore, you can compare them apples to apples. We don't enter risk into the formula that you used to tell me you wanted to keep your debt. If we put risk in that formula, and you do have some risk, not as much as if you had 3.4 million, but if we put a low beta in your formula, it starts to neutralize and do away with all your spread. The other thing that happens is when you don't have any payments, you just straight up sleep better. That's true. And I've done, a, and I've done detailed research, 100% of the foreclosures occur on a house with a mortgage. Mm. And so I, uh, I would tell you this, let's do this. You could try this if you want to. I would pay them both off and if you hate it, go get you another mortgage later. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Fair enough. Uh, can I ask you another question, a follow-up question then? So you, if you should be scared do, to after that long answer. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back in stats if class. If you yank all that money out, we're going to pay We're gonna pay through the nose in taxes, pulling it all out of all of our, um, our retirement investments. How old are you? So it's like, oh, you're 57. No, I would not uh, take it out of retirement. Yeah. Is it all in retirement? Yeah, this is all. This you don't have any money all, that's you know, not in retirement. We have, yeah, we have some. How much? We have a um, couple hundred. Well, I'd use that then. Ta-da! Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have a good income, and I would just, no, I'm not going to cash out and pay penalties on your retirement. I was not suggesting that, but because that changes the formula. Now, you may have some capital gains on it, and I, I would do that. I have lived 100% debt-free since I went broke 30-something years ago, and I have had a wonderful life. I've made a lot of money. I have a lot of investments, and they're all paid for. And when crap happens, like the Island of Misfit Toys is misbehaving up in Washington, D.C. right now, and they're screwing up the whole freaking economy, I'm sitting here peaceful 
and slept really good last night, except that my four-year-old grandson put a plastic snake under my pillow. <laughs> but other than that, I slept great last night. That really did happen. Good for him. Cindy's in Baton Rouge. Hi, Cindy. How are you? Hi, Dave. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Um, we have, my husband and I have 460000 in a money market type account, and then we have 135000 in cash. And we're to the point of saying, what do we do with this? We're not making any profit on most of that money. And um, we took the 460 out of equities and securities because we were losing a lot of money in that. And uh, that money had come from a home that we sold. And because we got an interest rate of 2.5 on a new home, uh, we went with the 2.5 and put the 460 into securities and equities and uh, didn't want to lose it beyond what we put in there. So we put it in the money market. Mm. What do you owe on your home? 366K. Okay. Um, from 30 years of coaching people how to become wealthy and from doing uh, a study of 10,000 millionaires, these are the two sources for my data that tells me the shortest distance between where you are and wealth is two things. is a um, consistently funded... 401k Roth IRA in good growth stock mutual funds over a long period of time that becomes some money and a paid for house. Our last debt free scream was a $600,000 uh, paid for house and $800,000 in their 401k or reverse, I forget which, but it was $1.4 million net worth. And it was just a few moments ago while you were on hold, you heard it. Yes. Okay. So that is the typical path that we see that is the most often used by people who become millionaires. Now, where does that take us in your situation? It says I would pay off my house today. Because here's what you ended up doing. It wasn't the start of your plan, but the net result of your plan is you borrowed money at 2.35% and invested it at a half a percent. Right? Yes, sir. We were... I know that we wasn't where you, that wasn't what you set out to do, but that's where you ended up, isn't it? It is. I pay off I my house today. Advisor. Today. <laughs> By close of business today. Write a check. Okay. Okay. And now you don't have any house payment anymore. How's that feel? Awesome, because now, I want to retire. <laughs> yeah, and now you got $200,000 in cash that we got to do something better than a stupid money market account with. You need an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses for your short-term emergencies. And, um, I mean, you know, let's call that fifty grand at your house for the fun of it. You've still got 150000 that you need to do something with other than a stupid butt savings account. Now, if you put it into some kind of a mix with a stockbroker and you were losing money, I get that. If you put it into good mutual funds and the overall economy slowed down like it is right now and the value went down, then you didn't have somebody good in your corner to coach you and say, hey, the only person who gets hurt on a roller coaster is those that jump off in the middle of the ride, which is exactly what you did. Now, were you mm -hmm. invested in single stocks? No. You are in mutual were funds. Very diversified. In mutual funds. Some of them were mutual funds. Okay. Well, what I would do is sit down with a good investment broker, and here's what you're looking for this time. Um, and and uh, you're looking for someone with the heart of a teacher that teaches you the history of the mutual fund that you're putting the money into. Okay, I'll give you an example. I own one that's over 80 years old. In the 80 years it's been open, fewer than 15 of the, those 80 years has have been a down year. So if we happen to have a down year, and I know that, I know that, not my broker knows that, but I know that, then I'm not freaking out. It's kind of like the house that you own in Baton Rouge. If it went down in value this year, you wouldn't freak out because generally speaking, homes in the neighborhood you live in for the past 40 years have gone up in value. Agreed? Agreed. So you wouldn't freak out on one down year and bail out. That's just like that mutual fund I'm describing. I'm not going to freak out in one down year and bail out. But that's all knowledge on your part rather than depending on someone else to tell you what to do and then you get scared because you watch the news. And you never take financial advice from the news. 
if the commercial breaks where you're watching TV are walk-in bathtubs, gold commercials, and reverse mortgages and snuggies, that tells you you don't want to take financial advice there. That's just a bad plan. And so uh, here's me looking at you, Fox. But anyway, yeah, so there you go. But the uh, Fox business, right? But uh, I love them. They're wonderful. But the commercials are comical. Saturday Night Live I'm trying comical. so hard. I, I can't hold it in. You're not saying walk-in bathtubs are a bad idea. It's just the investment advice. I'm just saying if this is where you get your I investment know what you're advice. Saying. I know what you're the, saying. When the commercial breaks or walk-in bathtubs and snuggies, then you know you're not getting good. This is, this is a bad place. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was perfect. I'm sorry. That just got me. That was like the church giggle. I couldn't hold it well, any longer. I mean, we've all sat and watched them at the commercial I know breaks, exactly. Right? I know exactly what you're yeah, talking so, about. But, yeah, the, uh, and, and we're on there giving financial advice, so what do we know? But anyway, the, uh, uh, but, you know, you really need to sit with a good broker who has the heart of a teacher. Go to RamseySolutions.com, click on Smart Vester, sit down with them, interview them, and what you're looking for here is, is a type of wisdom not intellect. There's a difference. There's a lot of very, very intellectual ignoramuses out there. And that's not in the world in, in general. But that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for common sense wisdom that says, I bought a mutual fund that for 80 years has only had less than 15 down years. So we're having a down year. I don't need to panic. And that you learn that, you internalize that, you emotionally swallow that, and then it becomes part of your plan. And so in that situation, then you invest in good mutual funds in your 401ks and your Roth IRAs and those kinds of things, and you get your house paid for. And that's what I'm going to do with your 150, unless you've got other debts, and then I'm going to clean that up too. So I want you debt-free 100% and investing in good growth stock mutual funds. That is the shortest, pa that have long track records that are comfortable to you and that you understand what's going on. You didn't do it because I said do it or because some goob at a financial office said do it. It's because you learned, and your knowledge allows you to sleep at night. You know, Ken, that's the difference between tossing and turning at night mm -hmm. when the stock market's down, Yeah, is whether you made the decision based on knowledge you had mm -hmm. or knowledge someone else had. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, you know, for years, I mean, before I even started working with you, this idea, the roller coaster analogy that you've given, and it's really true. When you look at the data, uh, if you look over the last 30 years, you just got to stay calm and ride this thing out. And I just don't freak out when I see the stock market dip. You know, I say, hey, we keep investing. That's an opportunity. It's going to come back. And, and you're right. Knowledge uh, is what gives us tremendous confidence and confidence the peace. Yeah. And once you really understand that, folks, about the stock market, then when it goes down, you kind of go like, it's on sale. Yeah, we're getting bargain right it's now. It's a bargain time. Yeah. This is a time to buy. Well, we don't really do that either because I'm not going to tell you to time the market. I'm just going to tell you steady invest. Mm -hmm. Steady invest. That's all I have done. I have been tempted at times when the market is down to time it. Yeah. I really, really wish hmm. in 2008 when uh -oh. the stock market was crashing and the world's coming to an end and it went from 13000 to 6500 I really wish I had put an extra million dollars in. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Dow's sitting at, what, 6X of that. That million wow. today would be worth 6 million. Wow. Because the Dow's, you know, 30,000, over 30,000, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there you go. I mean, that's 5X, 5X of yeah. that. It'd be worth $5 million. Now, ultimately, I did have money in there, and it's mm -hmm. worth 5X. But if you could have timed the market and bought at the po lowest possible time we've seen in decades then that would have been the time to do it. But who knew when the bottom was? Here's the deal. Every dollar you add to your mortgage payment puts a bigger dent in your principal balance. If you add even one extra payment every year, you'll knock years off the term of your mortgage, plus save thousands of dollars in interest. Listen, I'm telling you, when the bank doesn't own your house and you step into the backyard, the grass feels different under your feet because it's all yours. All right, guys, thanks for listening to our exclusive Real Estate Series. It's been a blast, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. Make sure to let us know what you thought of it and share this series with the people in your life getting ready to buy or sell a home.